not all be bliss But every wound is treatable We won't go under, we're gonna be all right Hello everyone, I'm Mark Auerbach. Welcome to this Arts Beat special here on 89.5 FM WSKB and Westfield Community Programming Channel 15. How we're doing is a special series that uh, gives us the opportunity to talk with people how they're doing through the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, their suggestions for keeping active, and some of their insights. Our first guest today is Brenda garten Schoberg, who is a former television anchor and reporter and currently in the communication department at Western New England University. Not only is she teaching the next generation and the current generation of TV, radio, and print reporters how to communicate, but she's also in charge of this university summer uh, educational programs in Italy. Good morning, Brenda. Well, good morning, Mark. How are you doing is the question, too. I'm doing fine. How about yourself? Where are you sheltering in place? Well, we've been sheltering in our homes since uh, mid-March, like everyone else. I'm doing as well as everybody else is doing, staying home, walking the dog about four times a day. Seems like I'm logging onto the computer constantly for work and for social life and for all of us for information like we've never heard it before. As, as a former reporter and as a teacher of uh, journalism, um, how do you think that uh, the media and the press is handling this COVID thing? Is it anything that you ever thought that you might have to deal with as a reporter? Well, of course not. I mean, how could anybody know that this global pandemic at this level, although we also know viruses like this have happened before, it certainly happened 100 years ago that they're talking about those comparisons, um, but yeah, I think our I think our local media and national media, the networks, have all um, been doing a fairly good job in keeping us informed for life and death situations here that we need to know. Um, we always turn to the media in time of crisis. When you think about it, with um, tragedies that we've experienced, whether it's about shootings, um, other tragedies that we've had, 9/11. Um, we, we turn to our local and our national media to, to tell us what's going on, and that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah, I, I, I am impressed with the way some of the media are covering it and the fact that they're trying to uh, put a personal touch to the reporting that they're doing. Uh, there's a, a recent story in the New York Times that profiles a young attorney in his 40s um, who had been uh, sheltering in place up in New Hampshire somewhere uh, where he had a ski house. And uh, he caught the COVID-19. He was on a respirator or a ventilator for uh, 30-something days, and he ultimately recovered. But uh, this report was a very human thing about how his wife and children dealt with the fact that he was undergoing all of this and was almost given up for dead while he was in a uh, medically induced coma on a ventilator. And it puts a very human side to the COVID pandemic. And I think that a lot of our local media is trying to do that. Um, it's got and under really difficult circumstances. Oh, it's just so sad. I mean, you and I have both experienced some tragic losses here of friends that we've known. And so it, it does really hit home when you're dealing with people who you know who have been directly impacted from this. But yes, even look at Chris Cuomo, who was reporting from his basement. And then his wife ended up getting it. And so did his uh, one of his children, I believe. Um, and so everybody's coping with it and dealing with it and hearing about it um, as, as best as we all can. I think that you get the personal touch when you see people who are broadcasting from their own living rooms and their kitchens, nonetheless, um, whether it's our, our reporters or political leaders sometimes reporting from homes and all the main news anchors. Um, and we miss that. We miss that personal touch and connection. And maybe we're getting it more with people who are on television now because we're not having such personal connections with some of our friends as we used to. We miss the socialization. You and I enjoy having coffee together every now and then. Um, and so we'll sip our coffee here together now instead and still connect and um, try to remain as positive as we can as a whole society to try to get through this ordeal. 
you know, one of the things that I learned during this um, kind of social distancing is I'm a real people person like you. And my work day, even though I work from home a good percentage of the time, my work day is full of meetings over coffee or networking opportunities or a big part of my career is covering theater. And there have been no live theater performances in over a month and not right. likely to resume. So I'm finding it very difficult not to work from home. I can do that. But the lack of the ability to socialize other than on the phone or online, uh, not seeing people is the most difficult part for me. And I think that's what we're really trying to all figure out. How are we going to do this moving forward? Of course, we're all waiting for that big cure-all vaccine so we can get life back to as normal as we know it. Um, but until then, I think we're all being very inventive and creative on what we're doing, whether it's theater and look at Saturday Night Live and sometimes what they're doing from their homes. Um, theater, I know the, the sports industry, the entertainment industry has been hit terribly hard, but we're all, as the saying goes, in this together. We're trying to figure it out at the university level. You hear what colleges and universities are going to be trying to do for this fall's enrollment, and that's become a major story. I know Purdue, I believe, was one of the first to announce that, yes, they are going back full capacity. They have 50,000 students there in West Lafayette, Indiana. Um, so how they're figuring it out is what other colleges and universities, including Western New England University, um, on what dorm life will be like and our social life. Um, we all miss that, and we all realize now how valuable it is and we'll never take it for granted again. One of, the thing, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is your classes at Western New England, which are involved television, radio, print, journalism, have all gone online. What in this pandemic are your students learning that they would not have learned if the pandemic hadn't happened? Well, they're seeing a real live news story unfold at a magnitude that none of us have ever known before. I can't imagine when they're our age and talking about how they lived through it and what they experienced. Um, but they're getting real practical experience on what this is all about. And online communication has really always been a part of the discipline of communication. Anybody in this field or teaching this topic always uses some form of electronic communication as an aspect of any course, but especially for radio and for television and video communication and digital communication. So um, our students, like all students now, no matter what the discipline, are having real life lessons in this vital importance of, of digital communication. So my students are still creating some videos and radio reports and sending them online as they always have. Other disciplines are realizing now how they're doing in their courses and, and turning everything online. But I think the younger generation really wraps their arms around this more than ever before. I mean, they are now going to have skills that are going to be critical and vital for any workplace. No matter what business you have now, you're online, you're doing all your social media, your business, your sales, um, advertising, everything is online. Um, so I think they're going to be better prepared for what workplaces are going to look like in the future. Nobody had Zoom as part of their constant vocabulary than they do now. Um, it's interesting. I just received an email this morning from one of our great students. She was a communication major with us at Western New England, and now she's a law school student. And um, her name is Bailey Holtzen, and she's from Springfield. And she just jotted an email this very morning and said, despite from working from home, law school going virtual, we're doing remarkably well, we are busy. And then she said, we finished one of our law school finals, and we have one more to go. We did an oral argument via Zoom. And she says, as always, those communication lessons on professionalism helped us immensely, and they were awarded best oral argument in her class. So, you know, these skills that we're learning are helping us implement our path to the future and what it's going to look like. You know, one of the things I'm realizing as we're talking, when we started out in reporting, and I was more radio, you were more TV, we didn't even really have internet uh, capabilities that we have now, let alone Zoom or FaceTime or Google Hangouts and things like that. And cell phones were sort of new. And uh, I remember doing stories on the very first cell phone. And can I remember back in 
South Bend, Indiana, when I was a reporter at CBS, thinking, who in the world would want to talk on a phone from their car? <laughs> now we're really dating ourselves, but I can tell you, Mark, I started on a manual typewriter. So, um, yes, we've come a long way in our communication. And I, I, when I was thinking uh, about how we've come, like Zoom, I, my ability to work at home uh, using social media, which is something I knew nothing about 10 years ago, really, um, although I had done work for AOL in the 90s, um, I was very comfortable working online and using Messenger and stuff like that. But I never thought that I would actually be mounting social media campaigns for clients and working within that realm, even producing programming like this. But I right. think back to times when, for me, uh, working in radio, you went to a teletype um, for Associated Press, and it was called Rip and Read if you were doing the oh, news. Oh, sure. You know, oh, sure. Or with the computer printing out the Associated Press things and with a scissor cutting the stories that you were going to do and pasting them onto an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Whereas now um, the whole way that we gather information, the way we dispense it is completely different. Absolutely. Um, and I think our students are adapting well. Um, they have to, and faculty also. I mean, colleges and universities are hubs for critical thinking skills and trying to solve problems, and that's what we all need to do. And to, we always used to teach to be a, a journalist today. You have to be a multimedia journalist and know many different platforms. You know, to write well certainly is the foundation of everything, but then also turn it into that radio report and that video report. And what would it look like if it was a music video? And what would it look like simply for an interview one-on-one -on -one, like we're doing now? And so all of these, you know, the website, how would it look if it was just writing copy online? So all of this is coming to real life like never before, and we are all forced to go online. And um, I think it's going to fundamentally change the way that a lot of us teach and include online communication in everything that we do. I think probably the hardest hit area that you brought up before, you know, the, the entertainment industry. But yet, look, the NFL went online with their draft, and they have the highest, the highest ratings that they've had in years ever, um, I, I believe, for the NFL draft that they, that they had um, not that long ago. So um, it worked for them. Yeah, the theater industry has um, done, I mean, the theaters are closed in New York until at least June 7th, probably right. longer. But there was a 90th uh, birthday salute to the composer Stephen Sondheim that had been planned for months and months. It was going to be a benefit um, live performance. And they moved the entire thing online. They had people singing from their living rooms uh, and bedrooms mm -hmm. and bathrooms across the country. And I found it kind of entertaining because, uh, first of all, I don't know how they managed to produce it. But second of all, to see people casually attired in their own homes and, you know, in the background, you'd see what their den looked like or their kitchen. And the actress, Laura Benanti, who's well known on television, she sang a Sondheim song from her bathroom because she said it had the best acoustics in the house. Yeah, and, so. um, <laughs> you know, I found it it's a new theater of sorts, and on Wednesdays now, uh, Hartford Stage and Theater Works and some of the other arts organizations, for some reason, choose to do their online stuff on Wednesday. And mm. there's so much to choose from that you wouldn't have had that choice if they were performing live. Right. I think we're going to have new careers on staging, how they used to stage homes for realty, a staging for the, for the scenery behind people and what the design looks like behind somebody in a, in a Zoom call or something. Yeah, and definitely, I mean. definitely lighting, Brenda. I mean, when <laughs> I have to Zoom from my house, if I'm Zooming from the kitchen, I take my laptop and everything there, there's the natural light if it's during the day. But where my <laughs> desk is, it adds 20 pounds of weight and big circles <laughs> under my eyes. We're all going to have to learn hairstyling, makeup, and lighting in order to be successful. Uh, we'll push that computer screen back a little bit further than we normally work with it, I think. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You see who has chandeliers and who has the dog that enters a, a program every now and then and a couple of children here and then. I think Nick Bannon did one with one of his. I think he had a child on one of their public service announcements of saying thank you. And, you know, Mark, getting back to, to local media, I really congratulate what people have done here at Western Mass News and certainly 22, my old stomping grounds there. Um, I'm really proud of my 
former colleagues and how they're handling all this. Um, it couldn't be easy. This happened immediately overnight. Um, I remember, know. unfortunately, it, it, it after, within after seconds. I, my right. former colleagues, I think, at uh, New England Public Radio, and now they're affiliated with WGBY, they have really done a great job um, under really tough circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, one of the things that you got to do, which I've always been envious of, you are um, the coordinator for uh, Western New England University Summer Abroad Program in Sorrento, and unfortunately that got canceled. Um, right. Do you think that uh, a s- summer abroad and study abroad programs will come back? I do. I really think so. Um, and it just takes one vaccine for all of this to be over. And they're working on that. When you think of the smartest scientists in the world working on this race for a cure, um, I think it will happen. And I think people will want to get back to work. They are. They're already striking to get back to work. And certainly included in that are wanting to travel and wanting to go not only in our country to places we haven't been able to do over the last couple of months, but to travel abroad again. It's, a, it's a, a great component of a college education. And students love it, and they say it's life-changing. The Sorrento program um, is, is phenomenal, and, um, and so are all of our study abroad programs. You know, we go to London. We go to, we've been to Cuba. We go um, to South Africa. Um, and so I think that's a real great part. And you did, too. You traveled internationally. I, I think tra- it's a oh, great for, education. For play, sure. Sure, absolutely. You do come back changed, and it is a life-changing experience. So, how, did you, how did you choose Sorrento, or did Sorrento choose you? Sorrento chose me. I was lucky enough that our dean in the College of Arts and Sciences, Saeed Garamani, asked if I would teach and, and now direct the program. And it's, um, so I was lucky enough to, um, to be involved with it, and, um, and it's tremendous. You've been to Italy several times yourself, um, but all places to travel. Um, Australia we have. Our, our, um, our new provost, our interim provost, Kurt Hamakawa, takes students to the Olympics every year. And now here, you know, with everything going on with the Olympics, I mean, what will happen in 2021? I don't know. We'll see. But um, hopefully life will get back to some sense of normal. But yet now students, and especially these high school students coming into college, they will now be better learners because uh, so many of our platforms anyway, we, we have a system called Kodiak at Western New England. I know other colleges and universities use others. So in a sense, even though we're lecturing in the classroom, we're also online. It's almost a hybrid. Students, you know, the PowerPoints are all up there, the lectures, the articles, the assignments, the classroom discussions are all online too. So they help complement the in-class teaching. So um, those students coming in from high school after all of this ordeal will certainly be better suited for life at college and also thereafter as all these businesses um, regroup and reconfigure how they're going to conduct their business. My husband, as you know, owns a small business in in, um, West Springfield, New England Business Machine Company, and he's figuring out how he's going to be conducting his business now moving forward. So everything's different. And and we hear that saying over and over again that we're all in this together. We, we all really are. are. And I think we, we, we need to be flexible. And that's something that we're learning bit by bit. I mean, it's so easy to get set in your ways, whether you're a teacher or a media person, whatever, and go, this is my routine. And now all of our routines have been shaken up. Right. And I think students, I think the younger generation can adapt well to anything. I always teach, be flexible. You always have to be flexible. You never know what's coming. And, um, and I think this is a lesson that, that we all know. Unfortunately, we know it has the dire consequences that, that came with it. And my brother always said, never underestimate the fundamental randomness of life. Um, that's somebody who's been through um, some, some serious uh, illness in his past, and, and none of us knows what our future holds, but now at least we can be better prepared. It wasn't thrown at us where we had about a week to convert all of our classes to online, move all of the students out of the dorms. Everybody goes back home. Everything shuts down. I mean, it happened. We all just had to hold our breath and see what is happening. It was hard to take it all in at the beginning. And now that all the states are slowly will be opening up and now we can be safe about it and we'll be better educated because of it. And maybe some traditions will change. Maybe we won't shake hands like we always had in the future. Maybe we won't be hugging and kissing. And certainly in Europe, you know, you kiss to say hello to total strangers. Um, 
I don't know how that will all change in the future, but we're going to be a smarter society. I agree. Brenda, we're out of time. Um, Oh, we can't be out of time. We are. We are. Boy, it's been great to talk to you. We've been chatting with Brenda garten Schoberg, who's a member of the faculty in the communications department at Western New England University. Many of you have watched Channel 22 over the years and see Brenda as an uh, anchor and a reporter. And Brenda, stay safe and be well. And as soon as all the restrictions are lifted, we're going to have a socially distanced coffee. I think that sounds pretty perfect. Thank you for being with us this morning. We're and going Mark, to take a quick break to uh, acknowledge the underwriters who make community radio and TV possible here at 89.5 FM WSKB and Westfield's Community Programming Channel 15. I'm Mark Auerbach. Peter Coles is our chief engineer, and we'll be right back. KB is provided by Betts Plumbing and Heating Supply Company, an independent, family-owned wholesaler serving Westfield for over 50 years, specializing in plumbing, heating, and industrial piping supplies. On the web at BettsPlumbing.com or at 14 Coleman Avenue in Westfield. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by the Dunkin' Donut Shops of Westfield and the Sardinia family. It's nice to know that even as the world changes, Dunkin' Coffee remains the same at seven convenient locations throughout Westfield. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by Bay State Dental. Comprehensive dentistry at 14 convenient locations in Springfield, Chicopee, Longmeadow, West Springfield, Belchertown, East Longmeadow, Ludlow, Northampton, Greenfield, and Wilbraham, as well as 29 Broad Street in Westfield. Bay State Dental makes it a priority to help you achieve and maintain the healthy smile you deserve. On the web at baystatedental.com. This is Ken Stomsky from Ken's Den on WCPC 15 and 89.5 FM, Tuesdays, 8 to 10. Community Radio, 89.5 WSKB. Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 at 89.5 FM, WSKB Westfield. Welcome back, everyone, to this Arts Beat Radio and TV special called How We're Doing. I'm your host, Mark Auerbach. Peter Coles is our chief engineer today. Our next guest is a fundraiser who began his career just south of the border in Ellington, Connecticut. He has worked at, he worked at Hartford Stage before he started his company, MajorGiving.com. His name is Bob Stein. I got to know Bob because he helped New England Public Radio when it was then WFCR and I worked there, um, develop a capital campaign program for the station. Bob, it's good to see you. Well, it's good to talk to you. I don't see you, but... Well, I see uh, your photograph on the monitor, so when oh, this actually okay. airs, it's sort of though we're talking face-to-face. Oh, that's, that's lovely. Uh, and thank you. I appreciate being invited to do this. I have this uh, deep love of New England because, as you said... I I grew up in Ellington, Connecticut once my uh, dad retired from the military, and we moved there when I was 11. And then, uh, yeah, I I did work at the Hartford Stage. I worked at the Nutmeg Ballet, and I I also started my consulting practice there. My wife got her Ph.D. at UMass Amherst. So we have deep connections there, and the fact that I was able to work with uh, WFCR slash New England Public uh, Radio was was just a, a thrill. I mean, great people. It's a great community. And, you know, I, I love the Pioneer Valley. And by the way, I also really remember Westfield so well because I used to always have to drive through there. And so did my wife when because I was living in the Torrington area. And so that was it was always like you got to get up to Westfield to get on to the Mass Pike. <laughs> And and you had said something to me in an email chat or something that you had been at the there were some dinner theaters like at Warehouse Point, <laughs> yeah. um, the Coach Light and another one, um, Chateau de Ville, Chateau de Ville, uh, which were just down the road. I mean, I drive by the shells of them every time I drive to Bradley Airport. Well, gosh, I know. And then you know, my parents had their fiftieth wedding anniversary. At whatever Chateau de Ville uh, morphed into, it was it was a uh, a 
function facility. Yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but when I would, um, my mother would pick me up at the airport at Bradley every once in a while, we'd be driving home, and she'd always say, there's no events there, but they keep their lights on late at night, and yeah, the place was yeah. lit up like, uh, you know, Times Square in the middle of nowhere. Well, and you know what? So my, my favorite experience there was that I ended up hanging lights. I was on a 30-foot ladder hanging lights, and uh, and I was like 18 or 19, and below me was a rehearsal for a Minsky's burlesque review, and there were all these, you know, semi-nude uh, dancers, you know, with pasties and all that, and, and everyone on the ladders, we were all sort of struggling to... Uh, maintain our balance on the ladders without watching what was going on below us. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it really amazed me that there was so much uh, dinner theater in uh, East Windsor Warehouse Point. But I know you want to talk about uh, philanthropy and fundraising. Right? Yeah, I, I really do. Now, um, your company primarily works with capital campaigns but uh, no we work we, we we're pretty comprehensive we do general uh philanthropy uh annual major giving campaigns as well as capital campaigns and endowment campaigns so we kind of run we kind of run the spectrum there and and have the my company has been in practice now for uh 26 years and you work with people all over the country, um, all levels yes. of not-for-profits, correct? I largely focus on uh, on uh, public media. That just sort of is. I mean, I've worked in a lot of air, a lot of uh, companies that were uh, cons- conservative, you know, into conservation, and and I've also worked in the arts. Uh, but you know, over the last oh probably seven years, almost all of my clients have been in public media. And I think it's just sort of the niche that I uh, kind of grooved into. Right now, I would assume it's a very difficult time to be fundraising because people are out of work and or laid off and uncertain about their futures. If you were addressing a nonprofit, would you say to them, uh, continue to fundraise or take a hiatus? Great que- it's a great question, and I've got to tell you, I am addressing because I'm I'm very fortunate that none of my clients have uh, shut down, none of them have had massive layoffs, and so I'm having uh, daily Zoom calls with them, uh, which is a whole another issue, which I'm sure you're dealing with with this uh, series you're doing uh, about how do we readjust our uh, our work styles to meet the the current uh, issues, but so we're very fortunate in public media that people are finding it to be so critical to their well being, and you know typically uh, most donors have like in the radio side of things, most donors have listened listened to Morning Edition and All Things Considered because. Those are uh, broadcast during prime time. And then what happens during the middle of the day, you see this, you know, they call them tent posts within uh, public media because you see this precipitous dip in listenership because once people get to their offices, they're no longer listening. Uh, But what I've been uh, observing and what I've been hearing from colleagues is that that's changing, that people are listening more and more uh, throughout the day because of their availability and they're not commuting. And so consequently, the revenues seem to be very, very strong. I, I know there's you know individual instances where they're not, but I think that people are finding that public media especially is, uh, is very important to them. And they feel that they're getting you know, reliable, timely, accurate information that they're not necessarily getting uh, through commercial broadcasting. So this is not really a bad time for my clients, other than the fact that if they're doing a capital campaign or if they're doing something that is major giving focused, it's a little bit harder to have uh, the conversation with donors 
you know, at at the same level that they might have uh, two months ago. But yeah, it, it's, it's well, really not a bad time. But at, in, in some times when you're dealing with a capital campaign or a major giving, um, you're, you're doing an ask or asking an individual to mm-hmm. contribute on a major level. And sometimes that really requires a face-to-face kind of thing. Um, because it's a conversation. It's not just, can you give me the money, but what are you interested in, and so on and so forth. Well, that is a great, great observation. I mean, you are absolutely right, and we are now, a lot of us, having conversations about whether or not we can have uh, large asks within a Zoom call. Because... I don't know. I think that the technology of Zoom, I mean, I find it very easy to use, but Mm -hmm. a lot of the donors are older, and you wonder how adaptable they are to this kind of media. Well, all I can say is is I'm older. (laughs) Yeah, I am too. Turning 64, and, you know, and frankly, you know, it's like a lot of us at this age, you know, my wife's, uh, you know, my age, and, you know, she's a college professor and is having to adjust and do, uh, uh, you know, her classes online. We're all, we're all learning the new technology. And frankly, what we've been finding is that a lot of people, even older than us, you know, in their 70s and 80s, uh, have learned Zoom because that's how they're having their conversations with their children and grandchildren. Exactly. Um, one of the things that I observed, and not in my role as a reporter, but more in my role at having a public relations and marketing company, one of the public radio stations in New England, uh, actually Vermont Public Radio, sent out a letter to its current and previous underwriters, and they said, look, one of the most important things you can do as a small business during this pandemic is to keep your name in front of your market. And they offered all kinds of underwriting solutions. They would change messages on short notice or allow people to move their timing around um, where if their mention was always at seven o'clock and they knew people were going to be at home to move it around later. And they were really adjusting to a changing market. Are most of your clients doing the same thing? I'm not quite sure they're doing it that way. I think that the underwriting thing with businesses is uh, considerably more challenging because they don't have that much traffic uh, into their organizations to uh, substantiate, uh, you know, large underwriting contracts with organizations. But I think where you're spot on there is that people are, it's important if people are relying on public media or any nonprofit, uh, it's, it's essential that we're able to constantly uh, resubstantiate our case for support. You know, you've been a supporter to this organization, and we're counting on you to help us now because we have greater challenges, and in particular in public media. It's like, okay, you know, I have a couple of clients who had to uh, cancel or postpone their pledge drives, and so they're not bringing in the same revenue that they might have, and so they're uh, reaching out in different ways to ask donors to say, look, you know, we were expecting an additional 90000 or or $100,000 in, uh, you know, in pledge drive support, but that's not coming through. And you listen to us, you depend upon us, and we are trying to keep, you know, our same level of, uh, of staffing and, uh, and people providing you with this content, so we need, we need your support. It, it, it is a fairly complex thing, and I, I, I've got to say that I worry more about uh, other nonprofits because I think that there are a lot of nonprofits out there that are you know, extremely uh, beneficial to their communities, but you know, it's very hard for them to be able to be heard or make their case you know, uh, in, in the midst of all of the things that are going on. And so I, I do worry about it. You know, I, I feel that some of them are really uh, very much behind the eight ball. I know that you do a lot of travel in your work. Um, are you, do you have an office or are you working from home generally? I'm working from home. And, my, and you know, I'm very fortunate that uh, 
We have a fairly large house. I live outside of D.C. in Virginia, and, uh, you know, both my wife and I have our own separate workspaces. My kids are adults now, so they don't live here. So we're, you know, it's, like, it's almost like there's almost too much space, and, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to get kind of very glib about it because I'm, I'm more concerned about people like my kids and because one's in Nashville, one's in Portland, Oregon, and just they live in these tiny places and, you know, with partners and just, you know, how challenging it is for them to be like in, in these small cramped spaces with their, with their partners all of the time. <laughs> well, Bob, so, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly happy. That's good. We're out of time, but I want to thank you for yep. joining us. Bob Stein well, thank from you. MajorGiving.com. And if they want to learn more about MajorGiving.com, they just go to that website, correct? That's right. It's amazing that that website is my brand. So I and I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to talk with you. Always great to talk to you, Bob. And, and in your honor, the next time I drive to Bradley, I'm going to switch my beams to high beam when I pass the former coach. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes, indeed. Please T- do, Mark. Take, take care. care. We're going to take a break here to acknowledge the underwriters who make programming like Arts Beat Radio TV and our special How We're Doing Possible. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. I'm Mark Auerbach, and we're broadcasting from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy. We'll be right back. Underwriting is brought to you by Boise Cascade Distribution, providing products and services needed for building material dealers, home improvement centers, and industrial customers. They offer everything from engineered wood and plywood to direct stucking and railing, James Hardy siding, and Adventex subfloor. Located at 33 Fowler Street Extension in Westfield and on the web at bc.com, they are committed to providing quality products, great service, convenience, and value. Support for the community programming of WSKB is provided by Bay State Dental. Comprehensive dentistry at 14 convenient locations in Springfield, Chicopee, Longmeadow, West Springfield, Belchertown, East Longmeadow, Ludlow, Northampton, Greenfield, and Wilbraham, as well as 29 Broad Street in Westfield. Bay State Dental makes it a priority to help you achieve and maintain the healthy smile you deserve. On the web at baystatedental.com. Hi, it's Bob Plass, and I have Wow! It's Tuesday, every Tuesday, 6 to 8. Wow! It's Tuesday. Community Radio 89.5 WSA. I did it! <laughs> Live from Studio 120 at Westfield Technical Academy, this is WCPC Channel 15 and 89.5 FM WSKB Westfield. Welcome back to Arts Beat Special, How We're Doing, here on 89.5 FM WSKB and Westfield Community Programming Channel 15. Our next guest is a freelance journalist and copywriter, Nathan Frontiero. Nathan and I first met when we were both writing for Take Magazine, which was a New England regional cultural magazine, and unfortunately that went by the wayside, but Nathan has gone on to write for uh, Different Leaf, which is a new magazine by the same publisher, and other materials uh, in a variety of disciplines, and he's also a copywriter working freelance. Good morning, Nathan. Um, Nathan's not coming through. He's on now. Good morning, Nathan. Good morning. Thank you for having me. How are you doing through this whole pandemic? You know, I'm uh, taking it day by day, you know, just trying to keep some semblance of a routine the best I can and um, trying not to get too far into the fire hose of the news. Where are you sheltering in place? I am based in Amherst, Massachusetts. So it must be really quiet there with UMass closed and the five colleges, everybody at home. It is. It's a little bit eerie. Uh, normally, there are a couple of periods throughout the year where Amherst quiets down as the college students leave, but it's certainly a lot earlier than expected. There's sort of the, the quiet of the spring break extended out kind of uh, for the foreseeable future. So that's certainly been a little unnerving. Um, in terms of your journalism, I mean, I, I know that you've written for Take and Different Leaf, but you've done a lot of writing both for print and um, 
uh, broadcast uh, web writing and articles like that. What are some of the projects that you are currently working on as the pandemic hit? So I have been working on, um, you know, different leaflets, sort of the kind of the main um, journalistic output that I had going on. I did have a couple of um, sort of side projects in uh, film criticism. There's a, an outlet that I've um, been a contributing editing a, a contributing editor for called uh, MovieFail.com. Originally started as a project with a uh, a college um, paper um, colleague at the Massachusetts State Lake Collegian. And I occasionally submit reviews and, and um, other uh, interviews. And that uh, has been a little bit quieter. The editor in chief is a, is a working scientist uh, based in the UK these days, but occasionally we kind of come back together and get a review together. So I had something um, out for them. And then I had a, a critical essay for a publication that I admire called Brightwall Darkroom, which is sort of an independent uh, film and, and culture magazine online that takes a more human look at film. So I, I had a submission in there uh, sent by the end of last year. It was published in, in January. Um, so I had a couple of things that were kind of out a little bit in advance of this. And then once the uh, shelter in place orders started to hit and the, um, economic impact started to sort of roll out over the industry. A number of the outlets that I have been interested in or, or eyeing if I haven't yet submitted work to began to sort of either close up freelance budgets or there were a number of even of, of media layoffs that I've been following. So things certainly shifted in ways that have had an impact on where I seek to uh, contribute new work. You were really building a name for yourself um, when I guess we met last year, um, last summer, perhaps. Um, and uh, you, things are really starting to fall into place for you with writing. Um, the film industry, is, has it shut down during the pandemic or is there still new stuff coming out online and, and uh, in some capacity in the movies? It's a mix of things. So a lot of the major studios have basically tabled their 2020 release slates um, and or they're moving certain things that were either about to come out or have already had some plans for onto sort of an immediate video on demand uh, service, but with a higher price tag, you know, sort of a $20 rental approximately instead of, uh, you know, typically like five, six, seven is what you might pay for a newer release to say from an independent studio that goes on video on demand. Um, so there's been a shift in that direction. And then, you know, even, uh, the Academy, uh, has, uh, released some, uh, I think some tentative plans to, to shift potentially the, the ballot rules for the Oscars coming up next year. If, if the film industry is in such a dire position where nothing has been really playing in theaters in the normal awards qualifying um, season. So that would relax rules to allow for some of these home video releases to end up uh, getting recognition. But yes, in the independent uh, circuit, there's still, uh, I think there's, there's more of a slant toward just sort of tabling releases. I know, it was a new Kelly Reichardt film that was going to play at Amherst Cinema uh, that was kind of reach out, uh, reach us out here, and that was tabled by the distributor A24. Um, Amherst Cinema, in particular, that you know, as in to kind of mitigate the impact of their closure, has been offering a virtual cinema uh, platform where they have other independent releases that are a little bit different from some of the things that they might typically offer, and the distribution. Um, Model is basically a, uh, a single uh, ticket price that's a little bit higher than their typical price split between the theater and the distributor as usual um, that allows for just say, I think it's, I think it's a couple of days of, of unlimited viewing. Uh, so some avenues are still open for watching new release films, but there's definitely a, uh, just a, a big shift. It isn't all simply converted to video on demand. 
you watch a lot of movies, obviously, uh, to write about them. Is it different different for you watching a film being screened in a movie theater versus watching it online? Do you have uh, a different uh, feel towards it, or which do you prefer? Absolutely. I, th- I think there's definitely a fundamental element of the of the theatrical experience that's lost in the home viewing experience for one just the technology we have access to you know even some of the best um projectors and and um and televisions are sometimes just outclassed by the theatrical experience and and certainly at home you know i don't quite have a home theater set up it's a little bit more modest it's just, you know it's just a regular television or just watching something on my laptop which is night and day from sitting in a crowd, um, you know, on an opening night or even an opening weekend or sometime during a film's run with the response of, of people around you. So it's, it definitely changes the experience uh, and it robs uh, the community feel. Something that some friends of mine and I have done to try to uh, mitigate that, that sort of loss is, is have sort of a, a streaming call going on at the same time, either like a Facebook like Messenger, or FaceTime, or Google Hangout, something running on a laptop file, uh, maybe like a Chromecast into the television to watch the movie at the same time, and using like a timer to start it. There are a couple different services. Like one is called like ne- Net, excuse me, Netflix Party, um, that allows you to. It's supposed to allow you to sync up different streaming, but we've found a little bit of difficulty in some of these services that are designed a little bit more for gaming than for sharing video. The technology isn't quite as um, flawless as it, as it ought to be for kind of sharing video streams. So it certainly changes the experience, makes it a little bit more isolating. And, and there's definitely more of an uncanniness to sitting on a video chat than there is, you know, listening to people laugh or, or react in shock around you or otherwise during a movie in a theater. Yeah, one of the things I found, because I cover theater, um, that to me the best theater is when there's a live audience because their reactions will change what's happening on stage and there's this symbiotic relationship. And I find it, I mean, I can certainly watch theater on my laptop or on television and stuff like that, but I've gotten into this kind of uh, sheltering in place habit of stopping the taping at a certain point to get up and get something to eat or to walk outside and this and that. And it's a viewing type of thing that I would never do in a live theater because you go from opening scene to the end and you stand up and stretch just at an intermission. And now I'm creating intermissions whenever I feel like it. So, you know, the one hour play becomes a two hour play because I pick up the phone and call somebody. I take out the trash. I do all these other things. And my concentration watching something online is just not there. I don't know. Absolutely. You know, it just changes things. Um, it, you also work as a copywriter, um, and people may not understand what that means, but you do copyright specifically for brochures or magazines or websites. So what kind of copywriting do you do? It's a blend of things. Um, I have done copywriting for, for brand uh, sort of building, kind of the foundational work. Um, you know, that sort of came before on, on the, working on the agency side, sort of anything from, anything from uh, uh, collateral to um, uh, social media posts and, and other content. These days, my copywriting has been a little bit more on the blog side and, and email marketing um, for a couple, um, for a particular client. And um, they're working uh, specifically on a lot of content these days that has to do with uh, the pandemic relief and even just resources for people at home kind of wondering um, how to use their extra time uh, to either, you know, try to reduce their stress or, or spend time with their family or friends in a virtual capacity. So there's been uh, a little bit of a shift more to like editorial type copywriting than necessarily kind of brand and selling, but there's still a little bit of, of kind of, straight ahead marketing in there, but it's through the lens of, of sensitivity to everything that's going on in the pandemic and directing people to, um, in this case, sort of ways that they can, so this one client, um, use their online shopping habits to, uh, 
donate cash back savings to nonprofits that are working on relief efforts. So that's kind of been the pivot recently. Um, I've, I've had a couple of one-off uh, just sort of brand copywriting, like a, a flyer for a, a financial client and um, about opening up new accounts. That was sort of the last sort of um, uh, straight ahead branding assignment that I had before uh, this whole thing. But you're still, in, but you're working uh, through it. Um, if you're writing about pandemic and stuff like that, how do you let people know about your what you do? Do you have a website, or how do you get your work out there? Sure, sure. So I have a couple of uh, places I focus on. I have a, a Facebook page. It's um, Nathan Frontiero Creative Services, where I post sort of updates about my work and direct people to my portfolio. And then I do a lot of my. Um, a lot of the same uh, efforts on, on LinkedIn. And so those two main hubs um, are what I just use to kind of be in direct contact with um, LinkedIn even more so uh, just because of the direct way of network building. Um, um, I keep in touch with, with you know, varied contacts in, in the industry, you know, folks that I might know or sort of, uh, you know, acquaintances that, that, um, our, you know, mutual sort of connections um, to try to um, uh, sort of bring in new client uh, work as I can. Um, as a freelancer, you probably always had a home office, right? Yeah, so I sort of have a home set up. Um, if, if somebody is now working at home for the first time, do you have any recommendations for them? Do you have one specific place set up that you work or, um, do you move your home office from room to room, depending on the time of the day? How do you make it work for you? I have the one dedicated spot that has everything, sort of the complete desk, you know, where I keep my wireless mouse and mouse pad and all of my books and notebooks and, and other resources to kind of to stay focused or, or get what I need or I feel like I'm just sort of best set up and, and comfortable uh, to get work done. Um, that's sort of a dedicated zone. And then, you know, I'm flexible to kind of move around my space as needed if I need um, just to walk around to get some movement or if I just need a shift in scenery within the scale of my apartment. But as far as general uh, advice or things based on my own experience, I would say that trying to find some way to have uh, maybe a, a milder version of your former routine and um, in just a, a general sort of maybe template of your day. You know, if you're going to, um, you know, aim for a couple of hours of work and then make sure that you keep your um, meal times as regular. Uh, at regular intervals as possible and you know, get some time to step out in, into the year if you can. Um, I think it's important for people now to, um, you know, if they have work, if they are fortunate to continue to, to be doing some work and have that, the, they have some semblance of, of normalcy in the day, but also a, a great recognition of the abnormal circumstances we're in, the unprecedented circumstances, and, and with that sort of a flexibility and forgiveness for themselves to uh, not quite be exactly uh, set up in a schedule that's, you know, the normal day-to-day. -day. There's a little bit more forgiveness for um, being, you know, not quite as on as you'd like to be. And so I think that that just breeds a little bit more um, peace of mind, not trying to pressure yourself to to be exactly the same as you were before all this, because it just isn't, it just isn't a normal time right now. What, what have, um, what technology have you found to be the most effective in working from home and meeting your clients and, and, uh, doing your interviews and things like that? Is it like zoom or FaceTime or the old fashioned phone? Um, of course, for one of my main clients, uh, we end up, using Google Hangouts a lot. That's just sort of a, um, you know, I, I'm sort of providing work uh, to them as a client kind of on a freelance capacity and, and they sort of in-house prefer to use uh, Google Hangouts. So that just ends up being uh, a decent option. Uh, and because it has similar screen sharing capabilities to some of the other services like Zoom, um, but maybe it's a little bit more, um, a little bit more streamlined. It's been around for a while. 
Um, for other folks, you know, for the occasional interview, um, just say for, for different leave or for another outlet, um, I'm occasionally still calling people on the phone and, and recording a call um, with a program called uh, otter.ai. It's a sort of auto transcription service that makes uh, a, sort of an imperfect transcript, but a workable one that you can then go through with the audio track and, and edit after the conversation has happened. And that, that makes the uh, journalistic work a little bit easier. Um, and then Slack and Asana are two good programs. Slack is a sort of um, co-working uh, messaging platform where you can also share files and links and, and um, it has you know, different other uh, capabilities. And, and Asana is a good task managing, project management platform. Nathan, we're almost out of time, and I had one other question. When the pandemic sort of goes in the background and they lift the social distancing and things start to reopen, what is the first activity that you have missed the most that you want to get back to doing? I think as a, as a freelancer, it's sort of the ability to break up the day by just say even going to a cafe and being around people and either doing work or taking a break. Just the, the ability to go into town, um, you know, from my home and, and, you know, either get something to eat or get, or get a drink or, or just um, relax a little bit in the company of other people. It's just something that you know, I think a lot of us just took for granted and it seems so simple. Um, but now that it's so absent and, and forbidden, I think that's the thing that I'm missing. Uh, it's one of the things I'm missing the most. I'm sure it's something that a lot of people are missing. Yeah, I certainly miss it uh, myself. I mean, I, I work at home other than when I'm here in the studios and occasional client meeting. But I would you know, kind of break up my day. I would go to Starbucks and have a meeting there or go to a networking activity or something like that. Um, you know, some of my work with Berkshire Film and Media collaborative they would have networking events every quarter where i'd get to meet people that do similar things and kind of from both work angle and a play angle was really important but i think the first thing i want to do is go to a cafe and order an espresso and sit at a patio outside like at Esalon or starbucks or something like that and chat with my friends absolutely yeah just you know that or you know Take a late night, go out to the Waitley Diner again. Uh, <laughs> you know, just something simple and, and, and with a big group. You know, once we're all free to do that, I think it's something everyone's going to be yearning for. Do you think that after this pandemic is in the past, that it will have cha- that it will have left a profound change on the way you work and the things that you do? I think that the the big shift right now, um, you know, sort of speaking to my advice. Uh, for for other folks trying to work from home for the first time or working from home more intensely now is just how we construct our day-to-day. You know, as a freelancer, I have a little bit more flexibility uh, with how I, you know, take my days. It isn't necessarily a rigid schedule every single day or it's not the same schedule every day. And I think that flexibility and uh, forgiveness and and a little bit um, more... um, balance in the day is something that people may take from this or certainly that I may take from this. Cause I think um, the concept of work life balance is, is, is so widespread and it, and it means different things to, to different people. But I think that a genuine emphasis of uh, your, your basic needs in the day, your personal needs, um, you know, your mental health needs are just going to take priority. And, and work, I think, um, is, is something that needs to be kind of negotiated with that a little bit more successfully uh, after this, hopefully okay. after this. Is Nathan, we, before we leave here, one more time, uh, tell people how they can find your work or reach out to you if they're interested. Sure. So you can find a collection of my uh, my whole portfolio of that. Uh, NathanFrontiero.contently.com. Uh, it's, it's sort of a big repository. Uh, you can also find me at uh, on LinkedIn, uh, just as uh, Nathan Frontiero. And um, on, uh, on Facebook, they can find uh, Nathan Frontiero Creative Services and follow me there. 
Terrific. Nathan, thanks for joining us. And uh, when uh, the social distancing is over and uh, we're allowed to move around uh, again, we're l like probably eight months overdue for a coffee. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to, well, much to catch up on on how we've uh, Certainly. spent the time indoors. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan Frontiero, freelance journalist and copywriter, thanks for joining us on the special edition of Artspeed Radio and TV that you've been listening to. Peter Coles is our chief engineer. I'm Mark Auerbach. We want to thank the folks at Westfield Technical Academy for the use of Studio 120. Um, Peter Coles is our chief engineer today. And don't forget to listen to Artspeed Radio and TV on Fridays at 8 a.m., uh, where I get the chance to interview a lot of the people that are making way waves and area theaters and concert halls and all of that and watch for some of our other specials on how we're doing. If you've missed one, you can find all of our programs on WSKB Community Radio's YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us. Once I hated this city now it can't get me down slushy humid and gritty what a pretty town what thought i could be duller more depressing less gay now my favorite color is gray a wall of rain as it turns to sleet the lack of sun on a one-way street i love the grime all the time and what more do i need my window pane has a lovely view an inch of sky and a fly or two why i can't see half a tree and what more do i need the dust is thick and it's galling it simply can't be excused in winter even the falling snow looks used my window pane may not give much light but i see you so the view is bright if i can love you i'll pay the dirt no heed with, with your, your love, love what more do i need what's my name helen what is that a tie what is playing at the midwood a movie <laughs> someone's shouting for quiet someone's starting up around down the block there's a riot and i'll buy it all listen now i'm ecstatic hold me close and be still hear the lovely new magic dream a subway train thunders through the bronx Street repairs. A two ton child running wild upstairs. Steam pipe bang. Sirens clang. And what more do I need? The neighbors yell in the summer. The landlord yells in the fall. So loud I can't hear the plumber pound the wall. An aeroplane roars across the bay, but I can't.